Okay, so hello everyone. So we're starting our Tuesday seminar and we're having Claudio Castelnovo who's going to give us a brief introduction to quasi particle and frustrated magnets. So Claudio uh, was at this PhD at the University of Boston in 2006 and then uh, was a postdoc for some time at the University of Oxford until in 2012 he moved as a lecturer to Royal Holloway College in London. And later in 2012, he became a lecturer at the University of Cambridge. And since this year, he's a full professor at the University of Cambridge. And uh, as you can infer from the title, his uh, main interests are centered around frustrated magnets. So let's welcome our speaker. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and for the invitation to give this um, talk. Um, it's, um, well, it's a pity not to be able to be there in person, but it's um, my first talk at this institute and I'm, I'm very honored uh, um, to be here, uh, I'll make virtually. Um, so I um, prepared a talk that um, is a bit of an introduction to um, frustrated magnetism and spin liquids and from a particular angle. Uh, of uh, an understanding quasi-particle content. Um, and then in particular, I'll touch upon towards the end uh, finite temperature behavior uh, that will be perhaps uh, followed up in some sense by the talk that you're gonna have next week. And I'll, I'll link to that um, hopefully throughout the talk. Um, oops, there we go. So I, what I plan to do is, um, I don't know the audience background uh, on the subject. So I'll try to introduce um, magnetism and particular frustrated magnetism in contrast to conventional uh, um, magnetic behavior and uh, introduce the concept of spin liquids and how we can uh, model and understand them um, through a couple of examples. And in particular, um, there are lots of interesting properties that I will make the case for in spin liquids and uh, uh, the central focus as the title suggested for this talk will be um, the quasi-particle content. Uh, the fact that um, quasi-particle excitations in spin liquids take on um, very um, unusual forms, unusual compared to the conventional, say, ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic domains and domain walls that people are generally accustomed to. Um, and I will introduce these concepts and how to model them and understand them uh, via two um, toy models, if you want, um, the so-called six vertex and eight vertex model that are closely connected to um, actual um, real life as well as um, um, well-known uh, um, systems. Six vertex model is another way of um, essentially introducing spin ice physics, which is relevant to pyrochloroxide. So it's actually experimentally relevant. It's not just a toy model. And the eight vertex model is closely related to the so-called toric code uh, that Gitai have proposed um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and it's one of the paradigmatic models for quantum information and topological um, order. Um, and I will discuss these models from a classical point of view first, because it's easier to understand and make uh, sense of their behavior. And I see, I'll show the um, quasi-particle excitations being deconfined and fractionalizing the microscopic uh, degrees of freedom in the system and uh, how understanding their dynamics involves understanding the interplay between um, the spin background and um, um, the uh, quasi-particle excitations and how this leads to interesting dynamic constraints and entropic interactions. And then I will um, move on to um, add quantum fluctuations and how uh, quantum spin liquid behavior gets even richer in terms of understanding the quasi-particle excitations in particular. Um, they can gain fractional statistics. Um, there can be, of course, uh, more than, uh, so the family of quasi-particles um, grows uh, the moment we enter. Uh, quantum mechanical Hamiltonian, uh, and as I said, I will touch upon the toric code and quantum spin ice as two uh, uh, cases in point. Um, the talk is fairly long, and I aim it to be um, an introduction to the subject. Uh, therefore, I would rather pace itself, uh, pace it um, um, somewhat slowly, make sure that everybody's on board. Of course, unfortunately, I cannot see the audience, uh, or not the full audience. Therefore, I have to rely on you to ask questions whenever there's something not clear. Uh, and um, the host will, uh, will let me know. And um, I would like this uh, very much to be an interactive talk. It doesn't matter how far we get with the talk, we will wrap it within uh, the amount of time. I think there's a lot to learn in this. 
and um, I very much welcome um, any questions you may have throughout. Depending on how far we get, um, we may enter uh, um, this uh, last point, um, which is uh, what um, um, I have been focusing on with several collaborators in my group, um, as well as outside Cambridge, which is an interesting finite temperature window uh, that I'll make the case for quantum swimming liquids that um, has um, presents some challenges, but has also been um, not very much explored to date. And uh, we um, make the case that has actually, uh, it holds some um, interesting uh, behavior as well as some telltale properties uh, for um, the nature of, of these systems. And I'll come to the conclusions. Um, so the best way perhaps to understand first of magnetism into, is to contrast it um, with conventional uh, magnetic behavior or conventional phase transitions, if you want, um, and then um, understand in what way it is different and what kind of properties um, we can observe there. And if we think about typical easing ferromagnets or antiferromagnets uh, with an interaction strength J, um, the typical phase diagram that we are familiar with is, a, say, a temperature axis, uh, T over J, where we have a high temperature phase, which is trivial and disordered, and a low temperature phase, which is ordered. And the transition between the two uh, happens when temperature is of the order of J. And so what we have in the phase diagram is either a region where the spins are liquid in the sense of disorder, but um, temperature is larger than J, and therefore um, the correlations are very limited. Um, what do we mean by this? What do we mean by trivial disorder? Well, you can think about having uh, the partition function of a system and uh, doing a high temperature expansion. And if uh, temperature is larger than interaction energy scale, then the high temperature expansion, the leading order term, actually is typically sufficient. And if you do, um, many, many of you will be familiar probably with high temperature expansion. If not, um, you can actually uh, just uh, do a backup of the envelope calculations, but the first term in the expansion, if you compute, the, say, the correlator between spin Si and Sj, is just the term in the Hamiltonian Hij, with a minus sign in front, divided by temperature. So in this trivial disorder region, what's trivial is the fact that the spin correlators you get reflect or mirror simply the terms that you have in the Hamiltonian. And so it's easy to understand them in some sense. Whatever you put in the Hamiltonian, so long as you know it, you know what you get out in the spin correlators. Things change when t temperature becomes smaller than the interaction energy scale, but that then in conventional magnetism, this causes typically an ordering, which is a dramatic change in the behavior of the system. And you have spontaneous symmetry breaking and other phenomena like that. Frustration is an, a term that is used to indicate the inability of the system to minimize simultaneously all mic microscopic energy terms in the uh, Hamiltonian. And the typical example that probably many of you have heard one too many times already is the triangular easing antiferromagnet shown on the bottom right in the slide. Uh, if you have easing spins around the triangle and you put one up, one down, you try to arrange them as antiferromagnetic as you can, you see that the third spin is frustrated. If you put it up or down, it doesn't matter. One of the bonds end up being ferromagnetic, even if your Hamiltonian would like it to be antiferromagnetic. The result of this frustration is typically that the, if there is an order in transition at all, it gets suppressed to temperatures much smaller than J. Actually, the amount by which is suppressed with respect to J is typically a measure of how frustrated the system is. And um, so the phase diagram that we are accustomed to gets changed um, because there is now a temperature window that gets open up. And what was happening at one, or T over the order of J no longer happens, gets suppressed to some temp transition temperature Tc over J much less than one. And there is in principle a temperature window now open where the system is still disordered because nothing has happened uh, uh, yet in terms of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking or other phenomena like that. Uh, and yet the temperature has become smaller than J. This order one dot that I left in the diagram actually is nothing much. And this, in typical frustrated system, this is just a crossover. Um, the typical signature you get is in the heat capacity, you get a broad peak. Uh, there's no singularities, no phase transition, but the peak in the heat capacity signals a substantial change in the uh, entropy of the system, uh, that suggesting that your degrees of freedom behave quite differently above and below this crossover. 
However, this is just a crossover. There's no long range order. But this intermediate phase now is special in that it has simultaneously disordered. And yet, temperature smaller than J means that you can no longer stop at the first order term. Uh, in the high temperature expansion, there are important correlator correlations in the system. And um, this is what's usually referred to as spin liquid behavior, is a disorder with long range of some sort, long range correlations uh, in the uh, spin structure, or a dramatic or substantial change with respect to the trivial disorder that you have at high temperatures. Uh, sorry, Claudio, to interrupt. When you yes. say disorder, you mean uh, not imprinted external disorder, but uh... Uh, disorder in the dynamics, or what do you mean by disorder? Uh, yeah, I, I mean thermal disorder. Um, like so, I'm thinking about, the, in this case, simple statistical mechanical um, model uh, where there are um, thermal fluctuations, there's temperature present, and uh, the spins are therefore uh, um, um, fluctuating, but in, not in a dynamical sense, in a sense, a thermodynamic sense. Um, so there's a competition between temperature and energy. At uh, temp when temperature is large, the spins uh, are uh, disordered, and then they acquire some correlations. When temperature is low, for instance, below the phase transition, then there's spontaneous symmetry breaking, and one develops um, some order parameter. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so to understand this spin liquid behavior, let's continue with the example that we picked earlier uh, of an easing antiferromagnet on the triangular lattice. The, if you think about the possible uh, configurations that you can have around triangles, from an energy point of view, you only have essentially two that are inequivalent. You can either have two spins of the same type and one different, a 2-1 triangle on the left, or three spins of the same type, 3-0 triangle on the right. Uh, these are the only two that you can possibly have. And clearly, uh, one of them has uh, three ferromagnetic bonds. The other has two antiferromagnetic and one ferromagnetic bond. So the energy difference is J, essentially. Um, and the Hamiltonian that you have in your system, um, if it's antiferromagnetic, it will favor two one triangles over three zero. And therefore, it acts as a projector, if you want. It tries to put as many two one triangles as possible. Temperature, on the other hand, wants to maximize entropy, so wants to maximize uh, the mixing of all kinds of triangles um, for that reason. Um, this is a picture that actually is useful generically for spin liquids, uh, not only for the triangular uh, model. We'll come back to the triangular in a moment, as I wanted to say something more generic with this slide, that it's typical um, that you have your full Hamiltonian of the system, and you can break it down into a leading projective term um, that favors a subset of configuration space, but not few, still extensively many of them. Therefore, there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking. and then let's call it H capital delta, and then there's H little delta, which is the rest of the Hamiltonian, uh, which are subleading contribution that may cause ordering at temperature smaller than this energy scale little delta, which is much smaller than capital delta. So the phase diagram we had before is at the bottom of the page, and it's replaced just by this picture where we have broken down the Hamiltonian just to uh, conceptually understand it as the um, leading part, which is projective. And um, if we, at temperatures of the order of delta, we have this crossover from disorder or trivial paramagnet to uh, uh, spin liquid behavior. And it's only at temperatures of the order of little delta that we have actually the phase transition to an ordered uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking state. The triangular easing antiferromagnet is special. Um, if we go back to the previous slide, we only have these two types of triangles and the energy scale difference is literally capital delta. What's special about this system is that actually little delta is zero or H little delta is zero. So it's a fully frustrated model. There is no transition whatsoever. So this uh, ordered phase is suppressed in the simple model of an easing triangular antiferromagnet. Um, so how do we understand the easing anti antiferromagnet? Um, well, we can look at temperatures much smaller than delta where there are mostly two one triangles in the system. Um, here I have the triangles that are shown with thin solid lines and the spins at their corner. And every triangle has two spins of one type and one of the other, or two one type. And this means that every triangle has one and only one ferromagnetic bond. And what's convenient to actually um, describe this system is to put 
and to look at the dual lattice, which is a dashed line on, in the figure, which is a honeycomb lattice. And um, every ferromagnetic bond, uh, we can put a thick bond on the crossing honeycomb lattice, which then defines a dimer model on the honeycomb lattice. And you can easily see that the description is dual. You can use one or the other as you prefer. It's a two-to-one mapping, strictly speaking. Um, you can talk about spins uh, in the antiferromagnetic uh, state or dimers on the honeycomb lattice. And um, the language of dimers is convenient for two reasons. One is that no, many results are known for dimers, for those of you who may be familiar with them. And the dimer model on the honeycomb lattice uh, has uh, extensive degeneracy. Um, which is one property of this spin liquid phase. It's disordered in the sense that it's a paramagnetic phase. It has extensively many configurations that equally minimize the energy. And the fact that there's non-trivial correlations. And this is actually a, a, a quite an interesting thing to, to look at and to see. And it's better seen in the dimer language than in the spin language, which is why I introduced the dimers here. Um, the reason why it's easier on the dimers is that if we look at the um, honeycomb lattice, and I've seen here, I've shown here, I'm showing here two vertices only. Um, in a dimer language, there's going to be one and only one dimer for every uh, vertex. And we can think about a dimer as a fictitious flux, mathematically speaking, as a double arrow, if you want, flux two from sublattice A to sublattice B. The honeycomb lattice is bipartite, so I can always assign uh, sublattice. Uh, labels to its site. And then I can call a no dimer a flux one from B to A. So I have doubled arrows on the dimers, single arrows on the non dimer, arranged in a way that the dimer constraint is actually equivalent to demanding that the arrows form a divergent, divergence-less pattern. Um, in this case, at the top vertex, you have flux two coming in from the bottom and flux one going out at the top from each of the two bonds. And so I have flux two coming in, flux two going out, and divergence less condition. Um, this depiction of the spins in terms of dimers and dimers in terms of arrows may seem um, just a relabeling of how we describe the system. And indeed, this is what it is, just a series of mappings. But it's quite interesting and powerful because um, it's suggestive of the fact that perhaps if you're trying to do a coarse grained field theoretic description of this model, which is disordered, we don't have another parameter, so we cannot do a standard landau ginsburg approach, for example. Um, what, um, what's suggestive here is that what we want to do is, is to discretize, um, to, to think of the arrows as a discretization of a continuous vector field that satisfies a divergenceless condition. And this means that it's as we are accustomed to from electromagnetism, um, we are uh, best positioned at describing it by using a vector potential and looking at it as a curl of a vector potential. And so we see that we have an emergent gauge symmetry because we have gauge transformations that leave the description invariance in the field theoretic language for this system. And um, we should do a description in terms of an emergent gauge field uh, where the field field correlators are the um, flux flux correlators, uh, which are related to dimer dimer correlators, which are in turn related to spin spin correlators. But in the gauge field language, these correlators are something we know very well, again, from electromagnetism, and they are uh, similar to, um, well, they are correlated as dipole fields, so two dimensional dipolar correlations in this case. And it's something I cannot go in too much detail for the sake of uh, progressing with the talk, but I refer. Uh, to those who are interested to our beautiful uh, review written by uh, the late Chris Henley in 2010 in Annual Reviews of Condensed Matter, um, where there is a thorough description about this, uh, this mapping and, uh, and its relevance. Um, the purpose of this talk is to focus on elementary excitations. And from the point of view of talking about excitations, I want to now change gear and change model and leave the triangular lattice um, and move on to a square lattice model for a couple of reasons. One is that it will allow me to introduce two models at the same time that differ only by the projective energy term H delta, but they work, they live on the same lattice with the same degrees of freedom. And also in the triangular case, we have seen that we went from spins to dimers, from dimers to arrows. Uh, 
Uh, whereas the new model that I'm going to introduce in a, in a second will avoid one step in the process and will be uh, hopefully more intuitive. Um, so for this reason, um, in order to understand the excitations in spin liquids, um, I want to introduce an easing model on the bonds of a square lattice, uh, as shown here. So the spins live on the bonds and they are again arrows up or down, which I represent here as spin plus or minus. Um, and the square lattice is bipartite per se, so I can assign a label A or B to the sublattices. And the advantage is that we can immediately uh, or equally represent as a one-to-one -one mapping the spins as arrows or flux arrows on the bonds, which is gonna come in handy in a moment, um, by saying that a plus spin is an arrow from sublattice A to B, and a minus spin is an arrow from sublattice B to sublattice A. So we can equally represent the spins as plus or minus or arrows on the bonds. And as I said, I want to introduce two models um, on this uh, lattice and with these degrees of freedom. Um, and I will not introduce yet the microscopic Hamiltonians, but I will simply say what the leading projector term, projector, uh, term does, H capital delta. And the two models will be one where the projector ter projective term um, favors the sum of the spins around the uh, uh, vertex uh, to be zero. So if we have four spins around a triangle, a square lattice vertex, and they sum to zero, they have to be two pluses and two minuses. And um, configurations are illustrated as an example here. And if you look at how many uh, possible ways you have to do that, uh, you realize quickly that there are only six possible configurations, and that's known as a six vertex model. The other model I want to introduce is where not the sum, but the product uh, of the spins around the vertex is constrained and is constrained to be equal to one. And clearly, if you have two pluses and two minuses, this, the product is one. So those same vertices we had before are still there. But in addition, you have the vertex that has four pluses around it and four minuses. And so this is an eight vertex model in total. Um, and we will go on and study this six vertex and eight vertex model. And just to touch base on properties that we have seen already uh, as characteristic of spin liquid behavior, uh, let me look at the, again, degeneracy and correlations. And then we will move on to the excitations, which is um, uh, the focus of the talk and as well as the uh, reason for uh, shifting from the triangular lattice um, to these models for simplicity. Um, but these models, again, are extensively degenerate. Um, so if we introduce just the um, degrees of freedom that I mentioned earlier and these projective terms, then the models are fully frustrated. Um, they uh, transition from a trivial paramagnet at high temperature to a correlated paramagnet or spin liquid at low temperatures. Um, but um, the number of configurations that are compatible uh, um, to these uh, um, projective term remains uh, extensive, which means exponential in uh, the volume of the system. And there is a beautiful argument by Pauling uh, to estimate it, but perhaps I can leave this on the side. And if someone is interested, it would be a good one that I can uh, describe briefly in the discussion session. Um, again, there are unusual correlations in these systems. And um, these are of two types that are very different uh, between the two models. Um, the six vertex model, um, is the closest to the example we saw earlier about the triangular easing antiferromagnet. We have seen that the spins taking the value plus or minus one um, can be written in terms of, or described in terms of fluxes from A to B or B to A, according to the sign of the spin. And um, so if you have a six vertex model that has two pluses and two minuses for every vertex, it means you have two arrows pointing in and two arrows pointing out. And again, this is a divergence of this condition and through a mapping that is, uh, or a discussion that is entirely uh, equivalent to the one I mentioned uh, a couple of slides earlier, uh, you can develop an emergent um, uh, gauge uh, field theoretic description and uh, dipolar argue that there are dipolar correlations and you can verify it with Monte Carlo simulations, for instance. And in addition to the review by um, um, Chris Henley, uh, there is a paper by uh, uh, Isakov and collaborators uh, in 2004 that discusses specifically um, six vertex and related models. Um, the eight vertex model is actually um, a little bit more subtle and simpler in a sense, but in a very interesting way. Um, if you 
have um, a condition, minimal energy condition that wants the product of the spins to be plus one around the vertex, you readily realize that if you flip two bonds at every vertex, um, you preserve this condition because you don't change the parity by flipping an even number of uh, uh, spins. Um, this means that every closed loop on the lattice, and in particular the minimal one of uh, flipping a single plaquette, um, preserves the minimal energy condition. And this means that any, you can back of the envelope uh, demonstrate that the spin spin correlation sigma i, sigma j uh, is zero for every i different than j. Um, so this is peculiar because at low temperatures, this system is a zero range correlated paramagnet. Um, and yet you have chucked away a big chunk of the Hilbert space. Um, what has happened is that you have turned what was a trivial paramagnet at high temperature to a zero range correlated paramagnet at low temperature that has, however, topological properties and has uh, Wilson loop operators, for those who are familiar with the term, uh, that acquire uh, um, non-vanishing expectation values uh, at low temperatures. Uh, and for this, I refer to uh, Kitaev's work. Um, I will not have a chance to discuss too much about topological properties uh, in this talk. Um, I'll focus on, focus on the behavior of the excitations instead. Um, but it's um, a, another hallmark of, of, of spin liquid behavior, the ability to have a non-trivial sensitivity to boundary conditions uh, without having developed uh, a symmetry breaking and a non-vanishing order parameter, local order parameter. Um, that's for the thermodynamic properties. Um, what about these excitations and which are the main reasons for switching language from the triangular to the square lattice? And um, I keep track of time, yeah. Um, so if we take, for instance, the eight vertex model, which is the easier to talk about, um, I've thrown here a configuration. So if, I've ha if I haven't made any mistakes um, around every vertex, you have an even number of plus and minuses, uh, meaning that the product of the spins is plus one everywhere. Um, if we think about excitations in a magnet, typically we think about a single spin flip. And in a ferromagnet, single spin flip is, if you want, the precursor of a nucleation event of a domain. And um, if you flip multiple spins, um, if you want to keep the energy low, you want to keep these flippings close to one another, forming a patch of up, say, in a sea of down spins. And um, the energy cost is paid at the boundary, which is a domain wall. And um, so your excitation in the system is effectively a domain wall. So it's a d minus one dimensional object embedded in d dimensions, if you think about a d dimensional uh, magnet. Um, let's see what happens in this system instead that has no uh, symmetry breaking and no um, um, order parameter at low temperatures, but we still have to flip a spin. That's the simplest thing we can do. Um, and if we take the one circled in yellow, we flip it, we realize that the two vertices adjacent to it um, no longer satisfy the minimal energy condition, the product of the spins around them is now minus one. Um, we could think about this as being the elementary excitations. We flipped a spin and we created a defect. But in fact, the situation is slightly different because the moment we have flipped a spin as in the figure, now we can actually look at, say, one of the adjacent spins, say the one circled in yellow now, and flip it. And what you realize is that the intervening vertex has now fallen back into its minimal energy condition because you flip two of its spins. And so the defects are in fact only at the start, the starting one that you left behind and this one that moved forward if you want. So you can view uh, the spin flip events as creating two defective uh, um, uh, vertices and moving them about. You can repeat the operation by flipping this spin next to it, and then this will move here, and you heal this one back, and then you keep doing it for a series of spins and going up. So you see that the moment you have defects in the system, you have something special because you have the ability to flip spins around them and move the defects at no energy cost. Um, so these defects that were created in pairs and can only annihilate in pairs because the only operation that is allowed dynamically in the system is a spin flip 
which is the creation and annihilation of two defects. However, once present, these defects can move and separate at zero energy cost, which is the uh, definition of deconfinement of perhaps the simplest uh, case of uh, deconfined quasi-particles where they are born together, but there's nothing holding them together. So the elementary excitations in the system are truly these single defective sites. And um, we can equally describe the system in terms of uh, spins or more simply uh, at low temperatures with the low density of defects, we can think about it as a lattice gas of random walking particles that create in pairs or annihilate in pairs and live on top of this spin background. And this is actually quite a powerful description because as you go to lower and lower temperatures and the spins become more and more correlated, in fact, the lattice gas becomes sparser and sparser and gets easier and easier to model. Uh, and so you have this important... Yeah. Uh, Claude, I have a question. Uh, so if, uh, if you just know the <clears throat> locations of two of these defects, is the path connecting them unique or are there several ways? No, it's completely in this model. Is, is, so I could have put the two defects here by flipping any path between them. Right. If you want, I can send them back through this one or going up like this. Any path is allowed. So the path <clears throat> is known only uh, uh, if you know the time history of the system, if you have a snapshot at the beginning and at the end, the path, path is uh, statistically delocalized. You cannot tell where it is. Okay. Um, let's contrast the situation for the six vertex model, which is slightly more complicated. Um, we can proceed in the same way. And again, in this case, I changed the configuration. The condition is that the sum of the spins is equal to zero around every vertex. And so I have had to adapt the configuration. And then I look again at the elementary excitation in the form of, sorry, an elementary dynamical move in the form of a single spin flip. Take the one circled here. If I flip it again, unsurprisingly, I get two vertices where the minimal energy condition is violated. And if you sum the spins, you get a plus one here, plus one here, so it's not zero. And now you can play the same game that we had before, flip an adjacent spin. Let's take the bottom one here. And then you realize the intervening vertex is plus, plus, minus, minus. So it's back onto the minimal energy condition. But the bottom one here is now sums up to minus one. So it's not at the minimal energy. So this seems to suggest a similar type of physics. We can separate, we, a single spin flip generates two objects. But in fact, this can be separated. There is a subtlety, however. We are not now free to choose any spin. Had we picked the spin above here, I don't have a slide showing it, but you can easily see that if you flip this one, you no longer send this vertex to its minimal energy. As a matter of fact, you send it to an even higher excited state because it becomes a four plus. So you have a constraint in how you choose the path in this case. It's not just any path. Um, we, we started with flipping a minus spin. We have to follow it up with flipping a plus spin. We have to follow it up with a minus and then a plus and a minus. If we follow that path, we are allowed to go forward. But we can only do that if we flip a string of alternating signs, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. Um, if we do that, separating the defects is again a zero energy process. And so they are trivially deconfined. But what we have is rather than having a simple um, lattice gas of random walking particles. In this case, we have a constrained gas of particles. Um, their, their ability to move along the lattice is dictated by the background uh, spin configuration and vice versa. As they move around, uh, they change the spin configuration, so they, they alter the background. And there is a very important and interesting and difficult to model feedback between the quasi-particle uh, description and the uh, um, vacuum that uh, um, um, bears them, that gives them uh, life. Um, this is this whole um, behavior is actually much better understood in the arrow language. And so let me just repeat what we've just said, starting from this configuration. Let me convert the spins into arrows on the bonds. Plus means arrow from A to B, minus arrow from B to A. And this is the picture we get. And let's repeat um, the, pitch, the discussion I just had. We flip one spin. Flipping a spin means reversing an arrow. 
uh, we end up with two defects. And now in the arrow language, again, in the pictorial description where we think about the arrows as carrying a flux along the bond, um, we see that these uh, defects that we created actually have an important difference between the two of them. One has three arrows in one out, which means that it's a sink of gauge flux. The other one is three arrows out, one in, which means that it's a source of gauge flux. If we continue flipping as we did before, flipping this one or that one, you see that the nature of the, uh, uh, of the defects is preserved. We have gauge fluxes on the bond and by reversing gauge fluxes, we are preserving gauge charge on every uh, vertex. And so this one is a blue or sink, say a negative charge. And this is red or source or a positive charge as they move about. And only positive and negative charge can annihilate. Positive, positive cannot, and negative and negative cannot. We have a full consistent gauge theoretic description where the excitations in the system are now gauge charges in that, uh, in that language. And as you can see, again, the, trans the constraint that you could only flip alternating spins of sign plus minus plus minus is even easier to understand in the gauge flux language by noticing that the only thing you can do is flip arrows that are aligned head to tail. So we started here that we had this path head to tail arrangement of arrows and we flip them all and they point the other way around. Um, the other interesting thing is that um, in the um, gauge theoretic picture, these are gauge charges. And if you have a field theory that describes them, uh, then you also expect um, um, some entropic interactions between them um, because um, gauge charges in an emerging gauge field uh, will have Coulomb, uh, um, a Coulomb interaction. What does it mean to have a Coulomb interaction in a system that has no energy? Well, uh, it means that as you separate the charges, the number of configurations that are compatible with having those two charges at a certain distance decreases in a way that makes the likelihood of those charges being separated to be exponentially suppressed with a factor that is the Coulomb energy, essentially, that is essentially a Coulomb uh, uh, interaction between them. Um, so let me restate this uh, a bit more precisely. There is no interaction whatsoever energetically between the defects. However, what you can imagine is compute the probability uh, of having two defects separated by some distance capital R. And then uh, this is what's plotted here. That's the distribution function, the probability. And he, you know, on the horizontal axis, I'm plotting the inverse separation. And the fact that there is a Coulomb entropic interaction means that this probability is the exponential of some function of R, where this function of R is the Coulomb potential in the relevant number of dimensions. I kept the dimensions here generic because I was talking about 2D a moment ago, but I actually don't, didn't have a figures to show in 2D. I only have figures to show in three dimension where the Coulomb interaction is one over R. And um, the fact that it's one over R means that these data points form essentially a straight line when you plot the uh, log uh, of the distribution function uh, in, as a function of the inverse separation. And then the fit is pretty good and it allows you to obtain the effective charge between uh, uh, of these uh, excitations. Um, is that clear so far? Okay. Um, so if we look at low temperature um, behavior of the system, and in particular, we think about dynamics, response properties, for instance, equilibration, um, we see that rather than looking at the um, strongly correlated uh, um, spin system, um, one can get a lot of mileage in terms of intuition and understanding by changing language to uh, that of the excitations of defects. And the fact that you have this sparse gas of point-like quasi-particles that move about the lattice. And of course, as they move, they have some kind of feedback uh, with the background spins, the vacuum that gives rise to these defects. In the eight vertex model, this feedback is particularly simple. And so the particles are actually performing a, a trivial uh, random walk uh, with the um, caveat that the particles themselves can be created or annihilated in pairs 
uh, out of the vacuum. So we have um, we can think about the language of reaction diffusion processes. Whereas in the six vertex model, there is an added complication because um, the motion of the quasi particles is constrained by the nature of the of, of the vacuum in the background, and the vacuum gives rise to entropic Coulomb interactions. And so the physics is 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 uh, somewhat richer and also harder uh, to to model. And um, there is a lot of uh, literature that has um, gone on in trying to understand the equilibration and response properties in spin liquids via these effective description in terms of quasi particles that have proven actually quite, um, quite powerful. And I'm giving here a handful of references, but there are many more um, available actually in the literature. Um, let me see time. Perfect. So, um, so far I've um, given a flavor about what um, frustrated magnets can give rise to in terms of spin liquid behavior. We have seen thermodynamic properties uh, such as extensive degeneracies and non-trivial correlations. And the focus of, um, uh, of my presentation has been quasi-particle excitations, uh, how they are born out of these systems through two, two examples and um, um, how they can provide a, a, a new angle for effective modeling uh, these uh, systems and can be quite powerful in particular in terms of um, their response and equilibration properties, um, switching a language from a strongly correlated uh, um, lattice model to a gas of quasi particles um, sometimes can allow, um, well, it can allow a very different uh, type of modeling and, and, and sometimes um, quite some uh, deep understanding. But everything I said so far um, was for simplicity uh, stated in the context of um, classical stat mech, um, if you want, um, that um, typically people are more familiar with. Um, but there is a whole um, branch of spin liquid behavior that ventures into quantum system and is, if anything is actually the one that attracted most attention because of uh, the concept of topological order in quantum systems has a, a, a strong appeal uh, for quantum information processing, quantum computing, for instance, um, um, and, and, uh, and has received a lot of attention. And so I want to um, shift gear for the last part uh, of this talk and actually uh, look at what happens if we add quantum fluctuations. Um, again, I had uh, mentioned earlier that one can um, typically describe spin liquid systems by having a large projective term that uh, um, selects this peculiar um, extensively degenerate but correlated configurations. And then we have everything as in Hamiltonian, H little delta, which I neglected so far. H little delta can contain, of course, some interaction terms that are classical in nature, nothing uh, uh, different from what I told earlier, but I will ignore them for simplicity. And it can also in con contain, on the other hand, terms that don't commute and uh, typically mean that they give rise to um, some kinetic term and therefore some dynamics uh, to the spins and then uh, to the uh, quasi-particle excitations. And so what I will do is again discuss them in a phenomenological sense by thinking about these uh, additional terms F as defect hopping terms, some amplitude little t, and because they are subleading, this amplitude is typically smaller, if not much smaller than the uh, uh, projective energy scale capital delta. And what this contribution does um, to leading order, to first order, if you have defects in the system, it allows defects to hop. And so you go from random walk to say uh, a system that has a, a tight binding hopping amplitude uh, for the quasi-particle excitations. And also importantly, uh, if you are at very low or tending to zero temperature where you have no defects in the system, then the hopping term of spin flipping term cannot act uh, and, at, at first order um, because it would introduce defects itself, um, but rather uh, it has to act perturbatively in order to induce some uh, steady, uh, some ground state dynamics. And this is uh, um, best understood perhaps if people think, if they're familiar with it to the concept of ring exchange, you can imagine that you, if you have a vacuum uh, or spin liquid at zero temperature, you can virtually pop into existence uh, two quasi-particle excitations. This costs energy delta, so it has to be a virtual process. And then you can move them around, uh, uh, say, a, an area of the system and annihilate them again. And this 
uh, sends the system back to the ground state. So you now complete a virtual process that creates quasi particles, moves them around, annihilates them back. And uh, this introduces a fluctuation or an amplitude to go from one ground state to another ground state. And this typically comes with an energy scale uh, delta over overline delta or delta bar, uh, which scales as obviously the amp hopping amplitude t, but it's suppressed typically in quantum perturbative processes by a power of t over delta that is uh, to the power n, uh, where n is the number of steps needed in the process. So typically, if you have a square plaquette, it would be t over delta to the power of three times t. And we'll see it in a moment. Um, so the picture that we have that gets modified with respect to the classical case is that now if we look at our energy or temperature uh, axis, we have a disordered power magnet. The energy scale capital delta signals the crossover to a classical spin liquid. Then we have this little t uh, below which we start having quantum mechanical processes. And at very low temperature close to zero, we have the conventional quantum spin liquid behavior uh, where this delta bar allows to create superpositions of ground states and therefore a proper quantum uh, spin liquid. And there is an interested temperature window uh, or energy window where I put a question mark here, where temperature is large enough to uh, keep the ground states in some sense defaced or incoherent, but yet temperature is smaller than little t, so the leading quasi-particle excitations are actually hopping in a coherent manner. And this is the finite temperature behavior that I mentioned earlier in the talk, and I hope that I'll get to very briefly towards the end uh, that I think is actually quite interesting and where we focused our efforts. Uh, but, but importantly, this, this is the distribution of energy scales that typically you get. And if you think about what the role of these quantum fluctuations is, uh, if we look at the energy levels in the system, in the classical sense, we had the uh, ground state configurations um, with the ones that are extensively degenerate. They are minimize the energy capital delta. Uh, and then and you have a zero energy, uh, a zero defect sector, and then a single spin flip creates a two defect sector, and they are all discrete. As you turn on the hopping, what you do is that you can broaden the zero energy sector by this energy scale delta bar that allows to create quantum superpositions of these um, degenerate states. And if you have excitations, you actually broaden by T because you have a tight binding model now of quasi particle excitations. And so you have band broadening uh, in that case. Um, The intermediate temperature range, just to maybe forefront, uh, in case I, depending on how far I get uh, uh, with the rest of the talk, um, the quasi particle excitations, um, sorry, the, the intermediate temperature range um, is the first, it's, it's an interesting regime that is between classical and quantum behavior, um, but it's the earliest that you can have some precursor of quantum spin liquid behaviors, which is the reason why. Uh, it has actually a lot of experimental relevance. If you think about real systems and um, cooling them down to look for quantum spin liquid behaviors, actually reaching very low temperatures is usually challenging in experiments. And so we're looking for um, highest possible temperature where you start seeing some of this behavior. And clearly not in the par disorder paramagnetic regime, but even if you cross below delta, so long as your temperature is higher than uh, any quantum kinetic terms, then you expect the system generically to be uh, incoherent and therefore well described by classical stat mech. And that's what I label here as classical spin liquids. And you have to be below this quantum kinetic energy scale to start seeing some quantum uh, behavior. Um, and um, however, if you are at intermediate temperatures above delta bar, then parts of the systems are gonna be incoherent. And um, they may act as self-generated disorder that gives rise to some interesting physics, actually of quite, quite of relevance uh, um, to some of the uh, um, branches of physics that have developed over the last uh, uh, decade or two, uh, such as many body localization, et cetera, uh, where um, you have disorder uh, uh, and well, self-generated disorder leading to uh, um, localization in the wave functions of the quasi-particles. Um, there's no framework describing all this, but there are a few interesting case studies. And, and in particular, one of them will be discussed uh, in the next uh, uh, talk next Tuesday at your institute by uh, Oli Hart. So I take the opportunity to um, connect the two talks briefly here. Um, let's put some 
meaning to all this. Um, and um, let's look at the eight vertex model um, where we have the energy scale delta that favors the product of the spins to be plus one. So in this case, now I finally write it explicitly rather than just telling it what it does. It's just the sum over all stars of the product of the spins, as you can imagine with some energy scale minus delta, delta being positive, wants this product to be plus one. Um, and as a transverse term, I put the simplest possible term, the kinetic one, which is a single spin flip. So if I write um, the H delta in sigma Z basis, uh, then I can take the hopping one as being a sigma X. What happens perturbatively? Well, in this case, in order to um, create a pair of excitations and annihilate it, I can do it around a plaquette, which is the smallest possible loop. Uh, and in this case, um, H delta bar now becomes the sum over all plaquettes of the product of sigma X's around plaquettes. And the perturbative energy scale delta bar is fourth order perturbation theory. So it's T to the four over delta Q. Um, interestingly, if we now ignore, if we take the perturbative term, but ignore the hopping one uh, for a moment, H delta by H delta bar actually form a very well-known Hamiltonian, which is known as the toric code proposed by Gitaev in uh, his seminal work, and that for a long time wasn't actually published and didn't appear until 2003 in Annals of Physics. Um, the delta bar term is the, sorry, the delta term is the one we know favors the product of the sigma Z components as being, being plus one. The delta bar term is the new one that favors the product of sigma X components to be plus one. Interestingly, they commute so they can be simultaneously satisfied in the system. And that leads to a great simplification in understanding this model, the eight vertex model or Tori Kodar, uh, simple yet exhibit um, quite interesting physics. And that was one of the attractions to studying to, for, it, for these models to be studied so much. Um, so the elementary excitations can be simply classified as star defects or plaquette defects. And um, they are point-like excitations in both languages. But what's interesting is that per se, they are deconfined bosons, but they have mutual non-trivial statistics and for which I refer to the Kitaev's work. But what it means that is if you have a wave function with a star defect and a plaquette defect somewhere, if you take the star and you move it around the plaquette and bring it back to its original position, the wave function's wave function picks up a minus sign. And so in the temperature axis that we have, we have delta T, delta bar, and zero. The temperature range, the intermediate one of interest, has star defects that hop, that are sparse and hop coherently. They cost energy delta, therefore they are sparse. Temperature is smaller than little t, therefore there is a hopping amplitude larger than the temperature of thermal fluctuations, so we can expect some coherence. On the other hand, the plaquette defects have an energy scale delta bar, temperature is larger than it, and therefore they're typically thermally populated and we can expect them to be incoherent. And this is a pretty interesting uh, regime um, because because of the mutual semionic statistics, it means that we have a, a thermal population of plaquette acts as pi fluxes for the stars, because if you take a star around the plaquette, you pick a minus sign is the same as taking a, a, an electron around the pi flux and, and, and the wave function changes sign. And so we can see that this intermediate temperature range uh, can be described as a um, random pi flux model on the square lattice uh, with tight binding charges on it, which is actually relating to a lot of uh, um, uh, literature, uh, uh, pre-existing literature in this new language. Uh, and um, it's well known to exhibit Anderson localization, weak localization with a divergence of localization length and zero energy. Um, and um, this allows to make, um, to change language and make a lot of understanding and prediction about the behavior of the quantum uh, eight vertex model, if you want, the toric code uh, in this finite temperature window. And um, both in terms of dynamics, of these uh, uh, star defects um, for which I refer to uh, the first archive mentioned here. And also uh, we can then assume uh, because the pi fluxes are themselves quasi-particle in the system, they are stochastic, but they are quasi-particles, they can relax in response to the um, kinetic energy gained by the uh, um, star that are hopping coherently in the system. And that leaves, uh, uh, gives rise to very interesting thermodynamic response purely due to the mutual statistics between the two quasi-particles. And that is a um, very nice piece of work, at least, I mean, I, I like it very much. Sorry, talking about my own 
the work of my own group, so uh, self-referential here, uh, but I, I highlight this uh, second archive uh, and, uh, and, and all his work um, on, on the subject. And if I have, can I have two more minutes? I maybe ask the, uh, because I believe I'm almost out of time, but if I have, let's say three more minutes, I cover also the six vertex, otherwise I get to conclusion. Could I ask the host to confirm? Yeah, surely, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so the situation is different for the six vertex model. Um, let's again, write explicitly H capital Delta. It favors, we want to favor magnetization equals zero at every vertex. So in this case, what we want is the sum, for instance, of the square of the magnetization that will favor zero magnetization as the low energy state. And we put the same flipping, sorry, um, kinetic term, which is spin flip sigma ix. Um, as you recall, not every path is flippable in this case, not every spin next to a defect. You need to have alternation of plus and minus signs. And so the um, perturbative term H delta bar is actually now a, C, a product of si sigma plus, sigma minus, sigma plus, sigma minus around the plaquette. If you have an alternation, now you can flip it. If, if the signs are not alternating, you cannot. It's the same order in perturbation theory. And again, as we did before, let's look at H delta plus H delta bar in H no, ignore HT. Again, what you form is a well-known Hamiltonian, which is known as quantum square, in this case, spin ice. And uh, for a thorough discussion, I would refer to a, a seminal paper by Hermele and Balance uh, and collaborators in 2004. H delta is the term we know and favors the sum to be zero of the sigma z components. H delta bar clearly favors uh, flippable plaquettes, which means plaquettes that have an alternating sign pattern plus minus plus minus around them. However, in this case, they do not commute, so you cannot simultaneously satisfy them. That makes the description of the resulting physics a little bit more complicated than the toric code. What happens is that um, quantum fluctuations actually promote um, the gauge uh, field theoretic description uh, that you had at the classical level to quantum electrodynamics. Uh, the star defects are the gauge charges, and then kinetic energy terms give rise to two new type of excitations, dual charges that you expect in electromagnetism, whatever you call electric, the other one is magnetic. Um, they do have cost energy, del uh, energy cost delta bar, but you cannot think about them as neatly as in the toric code where it was just the product of sigma x component equal minus one. In this case, there is no easy understanding uh, uh, of, of these dual charges. And there are also gapless photons uh, that make, of course, braiding and, and of, of uh, like adiabatic processes uh, difficult to define in this system. Um, and the temperature, intermediate temperature range that we have here, uh, in this case, that would be interesting, is one where you have sparse and uh, coherent, ho coherently hopping star defects with dual charges and photons that are thermally populated. The unfortunate thing is that we don't know exactly how to put this thermal population of dual charges and photons. And so the best we were able to do in this case is actually to take a more brutal working assumption where we think the spins underlying the system shown here as, as, as fluxes um, are incoherent and so a stochastic superposition that you can take an ensemble average over. And then on top of them, the coherent star defects are allowed to hop uh, in a tight binding fashion. If you remember, uh, the spins dictate how the stars hop. They cannot hop in every direction. And so what happens is that you can, given a spin configuration, you can delete bonds that uh, are not, cannot be crossed by the particles. And so you can actually just write down the network on which uh, uh, the particle can hop given a spin configuration. So what you can do is that you can translate the constraint dynamics into a tight binding model on a random network. And for each spin configuration, you have a different realization of the network that you can diagonalize and look at the spectral properties, for instance, and from it, infer properties of these particles. And this was some uh, work that we did uh, for uh, quantum square eyes. And the simplest case is where this uh, network becomes quasi one dimensional with um, um, offshoots or disorder, which will be indeed um, Oli's uh, uh, talk next week. And 
as without abusing any more of your time, I come to the conclusions and I hope I given a flavor or, or, or an introduction on how frustration in magnetic systems opens this new window into an interesting and unusual behavior that goes generally under the name of uh, a spin liquid. Um, it's, um, it has several features that I mentioned in passing from extensive degeneracy, topological feet properties uh, and uh, non-trivial correlations. Um, and in particular, I focused on uh, quasi-particle content and excitations that are also equally uh, exotic. And um, once understood, they allow for um, a powerful effective modeling of these systems in terms of these uh, um, typically point-like gas of particles and the vacuum that gives rise, uh, um, that, that bears them and, uh, and is close interplay uh, between them. And at the classical level, uh, we have seen this emergent uh, uh, gauge uh, symmetry, fractionalization, and then the description in terms of reaction diffusion processes and tropic interactions. And at the quantum level, you can have also dual quasi-particles and non-trivial statistics that make the behavior even richer. And I very briefly in passing mentioned this intermediate temperature regime uh, that was the focus of our work um, in, in, uh, in recent years. Uh, and um, it's the early precursor of quantum spin liquid behavior, but also interesting per se uh, as, as a new context for um, uh, behavior that is at the crossing, at the interface between classical and quantum mechanical um, and give rise to interesting features such as disorder free localization, fractal wave functions, and, uh, and so on. Okay, without that, uh, without further ado, let me uh, thank you very much for your attention and I welcome any questions you may have. Thanks a lot, Claudio, for this talk. Oh, just one second. There's always some technical glitches going on. There we go. Thank you. Um, questions from the audience? Uh, Sergey, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Claudio. Very nice talk. Uh, I have uh, two questions. First, uh, it looks like um, all the uh, examples you used here were based on the square lattice. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. What happens when you go to other lattices? Um, it's the, so the square lattice is the simplest um, where I could introduce both type of models. Um, so I wanted to be able to touch upon both, um, but there isn't anything particular. So for instance, the triangular lattice using under ferromagnet uh, is, is, ends up being an example of, um, that is similar to the six vertex model in terms of behavior. Um, if you go to higher dimensions, again, you can um, generalize this discussion to hyperonicum as well as two lattices or pyrochlor. Um, it's, um, there are um, general principles based on which one can expect one or the other type of behaviors. Um, the ph phenomenology can be richer, but if you have, if you stick to easing spins, effectively you can either have this mapping onto um, fluxes and divergences condition that typically give you an U1 gauge symmetry, or uh, you can have parity type um, uh, low energy states, uh, parity uh, dictated low energy states that give rise to a Z2 type uh, uh, of uh, uh, filtratic description. Um, and that's, um, so dimer models are typically, U, on bipartite lattices are typically U1, Dimer models on non-bipartite bipartite lattices are typically Z2. Um, dimers are clearly discrete objects, 0, 1, so they are easing in nature. Um, if you talk about easing models themselves, um, again, if you're looking at any vertex, if you demand that the, uh, if, you, if you demand that magnetization is constant, then you have a U1 um, uh, description, in particular, in the models that I discussed where magnetization equals zero. If you demand that the parity of the magnetization is positive or negative, let's say, 
then you have a Z2 type of symmetry and that leads to the toric code type of behavior. So there is a bit of generic statements that one can make and one can generalize these to many lattices um, um, without much effort. So also regardless whether they are bravi or non bravi so uh, going to some, it looks like you stick still to bravi or? Yeah, so I would say yes. Um, I mean, it's possible to define them. Um, and then one has to do a bit more work to figure out uh, uh, what kind of physics uh, one gets out of it. Thanks. Uh, in the first part, when you were talking about uh, the classical uh, spin liquids and uh, the emerging Coulomb um, scenario, I didn't quite get it. Uh, you said that the further the distance between the two defects, uh, uh, the less configurations uh, are going to support them. Is that correct? Somehow, yeah. intuitively, I don't get it. Can you can you give um, me? An so intuitively, actually, so the yeah. So um, maybe the easiest to in, is intuitively uh, to to understand this intuitively is actually to look at the arrow language or the flux language, and you see that if you if you separate two defects you must have, in order to be able to have two defects as shown in the figure, there must be one path from one to the other uh, that is arrows oriented, like the, the cyan one here. As we discussed, as you asked earlier, and we discussed earlier, um, this is not unique. You could take this path, for instance, that's perfectly fine. But the existence of this blue dot and red dot implies that there is at least one such path. Uh, in a Gauss sense, if you took a surface between them and you look at the number of arrows cutting the surface this way and that way, there would be a net flux this way. It's the same as Gauss law because these are discretized um, uh, vector, like um, gauge vector fields. Um, so this, means that you, in terms of entropy or freedom of orienting your arrows, you have reduced it because you are dictating that there is at least one oriented string from one to the other. The, the, the further you separate them, the longer the string gets. And therefore, the more it suppresses uh, uh, the possible configurations. So, I mean, it's intuitive. It's obviously not, this is not a mathematical statement, um, but intuitively you, the this, this spin configurations that are compatible with this blue and red dots being a certain distance apart becomes fewer and fewer as these particles separate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, st st the, 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 the more statistically, a uh, relevant statement is simply just computing the probability and, 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 and showing that it scales that way. But, yeah. Okay. Um, any more questions from the audience? Well, doesn't seem like. So let's thank our speaker once again. Let's take a short, probably five minute break. And uh, if people are still interested in having a discussion session, we can do this after the short five minute break, just in case. So I'll keep this session on.